everybody and welcome to the Good Day Matrix. My name is Daz and I am here today with the OG, the GOAT of sports psychology, David Galbraith. He has been the sports psychologist for rugby, for sevens, for netball, for the Olympics, for the Japanese rugby team, for individual athletes like Dame Lisa Carrington and Sarah Walker and he has generously given up his time today. He's the author of Unleashing Greatness which I'm so excited to read and I have had, heard so many great things about and he has been the guy, and Sheree Kaka, I know you're watching this, um, will, will attest that he has given many kicks up the ass over the years to get out of our own way and start living courageously. So I'm so excited. I mention David everywhere I go. There's always a DGism that I talk about. And I know after today, there will be many more, I'm sure, that I'll be quoting. So David, thank you so much for your Cheers, time Des. today. Thank you, for, thank you for coming and asking me to have a yarn with you. It's my favorite time. It's my, <laughs> it's my favorite thing to do, David. Um, so today we're going to talk about children's wellness and sort of from a lens of parenting, I guess, mm. or things that we can do to really mm. support our children and, yeah, help them to live well, but also help us to live well, yeah. I guess, in that expectation around we have of, of ourselves as parents. But I thought we'd kick off today. So you came to my son's school many years ago and you talked about 110 decibels of laughing and singing every day as being like a number one KPI of of children's wellness and really living well so tell us about that and tell us how how to achieve it or what strategies to put in place to begin to i guess the 110 decibels came from working in rugby with the chiefs and the metaphor if if, if they could sing at 110 decibels off the field then we could hopefully get them to play at 110 decibels on the field that was the metaphor that sat underneath it and the idea is that to sing at 110 decibels, you're going to have to let go because it's quite, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of energy behind that number. And so you, it's hard to get there because you've got to let go to get the energy. Like you can sing, but to really sing at that energy level means you're going to have to let go of the handbrake. And so there's lots of metaphors that came in around that and then that's what stuck. And then in my sessions, I wouldn't let the boys go until they've sung at 110. Nice. Um, and then that's where that started. But the same when you think about what does that, does that mean then for parenting or for children and for me thinking about teachers. Well, there's lots of layers, eh? There's lots of layers that just start falling off this because really what Layer we're talking about, yeah, yeah. Um, if you're thinking children and human development, we're talking about um, the ease with which we share and we connect to people. So really we're talking about attachment and we talk about attachment we're talking about you know so many layers of childhood and development that then results in what we see as an adult or adolescent you know cool kids robust adolescents adults of integrity so it's all connected so the 110 decibels really is a reflection of attachment because you can't attachment holds my view of myself my view of you my view of the world and my view of the future so if you think about the layers that can come from how i view myself if I question myself, if I question you and I don't trust you, if I question the world and I don't just trust the world and I question the future and don't trust the future, there's no way I'm going to let go. Yeah. So you can see how as a metaphor, it's still, once we start to think it like that, it's more than just singing, it's more than just a decibel, it's an indication of the child's attachment. Yeah. So the 110 decibels was about freeing people up to express who they were, hence the attachment link hence the identity link. So obviously it's one little number, but man, it means so much. The thing it gives too though, at the age, a certain age, it gives you awareness about where you are at. Mm. So just asking people to sing automatically brings up all of their resistance or their disinhibition if they're free. Yeah. And you can see it. You can just ask people to sing individually or as a group and you'll see straight away whether they're free or not. Yeah. And so it helps them experience it. Um, if you want someone to learn, we want them to be undefended. If you want them to learn, you want them to be curious. If you want them to be learning, you want them to be unconscious and free, not anxious and contained or anxious and guarded or scared, because mm. they're not gonna be learning if they're scared. No. And so what do you want in your classroom? We want your children to be free, mm. um, curious, comfortable and courageous yeah. and then they will engage in a conversation they will engage in an activity and you've got learning learning is an experience it's not a cognitive thing it 
thinking's a cognitive thing, but learning's a neurological thing. It's an experiential thing. So you can rope learn anything. Yeah. So you can rope remember anything, mm. but it doesn't say you've learned a damn thing. No. And you look at all, to yeah, totally. But you look <laughs> at the kids these days; they're all rote learning to get their credits yep. to get level one, two, or three. Like, well, how's that motivated by le learning? Yep. And so you can see how the whole system isn't designed a to allow children to get to a classroom and feel like they belong, to express who they are and engage in learning experiences. Mm -hmm. That's what education should be about, regardless of the age, five or fifteen or seventeen. Obviously, developmentally, there are going to be different conversations. But the process is exactly the same. Yeah. So the singing is about taking people there, allowing them to, because I can have a conversation with a rugby player after they've sung, mate, what was that like? I hated it. Well, let's talk about that. What's it like on the field when you're 79 minutes in and playing the Crusaders and one point down? Oh, same thing. Mm. So the singing's huge. If I was a teacher, and this is where you think about how does it link then as a parent, because I think, okay, what would I do if I was a teacher? How would I be a teacher? Same as a, as a parent. If you're a teacher and you want your children to learn, then your room should be full of musical instruments. Even if you can't play, you should still have it full of musical instruments and you should be learning an instrument. So the room should have guitars, triangles, cymbals, spoons, and your first lessons of the day, or the first, the first lessons, yeah. the first sessions of the day mm. should be play. Even if it sounds terrible, it should just be unstructured, disinhibited play. Mm then hopefully give them some structure to help them make it sound yep. together. Yeah, yeah. And so there you can see, and then obviously storytelling becomes part of that too. So if you're a teacher, I'd learn big learning instruments. The kids can see you struggle and then you can gain master and master. And if you teach long enough, you're going to become good. But also storytelling. So the 110 decibels, storytelling, metaphor, music. That's the golden road to, to learning and memory and exploration as a group. So they're, they're the 110 decibels, massive with regards to what that then means. That's it's so funny because I love music. Like mm. I'm, I'm the, Great. I'm eclectic on all. You know, like Wicked. I love any music. It doesn't worry me at all. Tell me to sing in front of people, <laughs> mute. If I'm in my car on the motorway drive in Auckland, I am like 140, 150 decibels, belting out my songs, absolutely just in my joyful spot. The minute someone's around, yeah. like karaoke, never. Wouldn't do it. Lip sync, absolutely. Yeah, and so you can see how that is a metaphor or an example of what we're talking about. Yeah. You could rate that out of 10 when I ask you to sing. Yeah. Right? And you go down one end, no handbrake. Yeah. Another end, handbrake. The level that you're on on that line from 0 to 10 with 10 out of 10 being free like you're doing karaoke mm. in Tokyo, right? <laughs> Hard out or 2 or a 4 or a six, or a one, or a zero, you could then overlay, the, overlay your life on that, yeah. and they'll tell you exactly where your life, um, life energy, intensity, pr um, gauge will be at. So if you're 50, if you're five out of 10 with the singing, I can, because I know the song, and I'm a little bit nervous, but I still sing anyway, because everyone sings when I want to sing too. Yeah. You can guarantee that your life potential, achieved potential, will be 50% and you'll know that you use 50% that you've left undone and you'll know you're going to achieve 50 and it will chew, it will chew you up. It will chew you up. Mm. You'll just be like, I'm so frustrated, disappointed in myself, angry with all the opportunities that have yeah. been missed because you've been 50% in, 50% out. Wow. So that one little thing, singing 110 decibels, will tell, tell me yeah. that I know then where you are with regards to relationships, money, mental health, um, opportunity, potential, they're all aligned. It's so true. I did a presentation for my nipple team the other day about this. We had to do our past, present and future. Mm. And I literally t titled one of my slides, Opportunities Lost. <laughs> and it was like not yeah. believing in myself. So didn't yeah. put, do all my best yeah. for rep netball, for example. I know I could have, but I didn't. Because then if I didn't, then if I failed, oh, well, I didn't try very hard. You know, I mm. put, and it's sort of that one foot in, one foot out. All right, David. And, and it's as big, if we think again about parenting, blah, blah, blah. Because we're parenting ourselves, yeah. parenting our kids, parenting ourselves, it's the same thing, no matter how yeah. old you are, you're in a way that you talk to yourself as you are parenting yourself. So it's as an internal experience and then with your children, obviously we get to see what the internal experience is because that's what happens with your children. Yeah. Um, the irony would be we're talking about life-defining moments. You're five out of ten, every life-defining moment that comes along, mm. the big ones, mm. 
are going to be lived from their underlying philosophy. I'm 50-50. Yeah. Had I understood that as a... Like, if, I'd, if, if we'd had this chat, you having this chat, let's say with me when I was 17, yeah. we would not now be talking. Yeah. Because I would not have had the life I've had. Yeah. Great, like I've been wonderfully lucky to have the life I've got. But the irony would be, had someone talked to me like I'm talking now at 17, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be in New Zealand. I'd be under the Yukon somewhere in British Columbia. And that's where I... Because I was lucky enough to be up there working for a season in the wild, uh, in the West west i felt more at home there than anywhere else in my life unreal previous live stuff i believe in it i've been there before yeah i did a did a um came home so fascinated by did a meditation just to think figure out had where my previous lives have been last door i went through open my eyes i'm standing in a high northwestern glacial valley middle of a in native american village covered in a mammoth skin and i'm like because some of the valleys I was in, it felt like I'd been there before. Yeah. Premonition, premonition. Well, it won't be premonition because it's not coming. It's yeah, been. Yeah, yeah. Whatever that is. Yeah. And so you can see how life-defining moments. Feeling, yeah. So we're talking about kids. Their life-defining moments will be influenced by whether they could sing 110 decibels or not, whether you encourage that, whether you're doing that too. Yeah. If we want our children to be um, stepping into opportunities with no handbrake, well, then we better be living with no handbrake. Yeah. How we were at 15 is how we'll be at 30. How we are at 30 is how we'll be at 60. That stuff doesn't change because it's, it's neurologically set mm. based on your upbringing and your experiences. No matter how much you think self-worth, no matter how much you think confidence, no matter how you think inspiration and stuff, mm. it's all just thought and it's not going to do a thing unless it's experiential. experiential. So get neurological, you've got mm. to go experience. You've got to do something. You just yeah. can't think something. Which leads us totally into, like, I've been recently reading um, Brene Brown's new book, yeah. Atlas of the Heart, and she talks about, you know, letting children sit in their struggle and, ah, totally. you know, letting them experience what they need to experience and not jumping into solve, yep. which is, you know, totally. so our um, our unfortunate, you know, like it's a need to, to support and help, but it's also an absolute blocker for them to learn how to manage and handle it, and we've had it with my son at school my little five-year-old starting mm. and having trouble but I was really aware of myself and so instead of going I'll talk to your teacher and I'll do this it was okay what's some strategies that we can do and he went back to school the next day with four things that he could do to try and sort things out for himself which worked really well and he's Work built it. his own confidence so Work but with the first I wouldn't have done that but I'm just so much more aware of what I'm doing mm. now that I was like I just need to mm. yeah back off but you've also talked about that as you know when we say um oh be careful <laughs> You know, in our minds, we're going, I love you. But actually, we're putting all these road mm. cones up of warnings. We're not actually letting them live just full mm. and just for them to learn from that experiential stuff that's going on. So mm. tell us about that, I guess, and, and walk us, well, not walk us through, but give us some strategies or some some things that we can keep in the back of our minds to go, oh, do you need to say that? Or, yeah. Yep, cool. Um, so if we can keep in mind that if we want our children to grow into certain types of adults, they have to have experiences along the way which which governs that ex mm. the developmental space. What we say, what we do will influence the space, but in the end it's their experiences along their growing up road yeah. that will give us the product. So if we can think about it like that, then parenting becomes the facilitator of experience our job is to make sure that they've got tools in the toolbox mm. to go into that experience and be curious, yep. not be traumatised. <laughs> and to make something of it. Doesn't mean to say we want it, it's going to work, but at least they've got some tools to try yeah. to go into that moment, give it a go, mm. learn, come away, reflect, learn, go yeah. again, more tools. That's life, right? Mm, mm. So if parents can think, like that, it, they can just relax because a lot of parents get stressed out by that. The, if they don't get this right, the kid's stuffed. Yep. Parents have been doing this job for a, a very long time without psychologists. Yeah. Right. So just relax. Even if you really, really muck it up, it's still not going to be that bad if you just <laughs> love the kids. So they don't. They just relax, and that's going to be the best thing they can do. Yeah. Relax, and then just think experiences. Now that means it gives them license to be fun parents because now they can just think, what's the most fun I can have with my kids? What's the most courageous things we can do with my kid? Mm. What can I do outside the home 
get out the, the the universe gives us everything we need for parenting you don't have to buy a damn thing mm. as long as you can get to a creek yeah as long as you can get to a hill as long as you can get to some bush mm. and we're surrounded by that in new zealand we don't have to look very far to find those no. things for free yeah and then you don't even need a tent <clears throat> just take a rope and a tarp just check the weather before you go right so just take care of yeah, those yeah, things yeah, yeah. yeah. but be, it's, be responsible it's just about moment. creating experiences that they can go and do with you and you're an auxiliary to their to their drama you're not the drama you're an auxiliary to support them in that space plus you're the director and the guardian over the back of it yeah to make sure that a you know what the plot sort of looks like you know where it's kind of going to play out <laughs> and then you've got the resources you've and helping them get the resources and the skills mm. to then enact the plot for the first time for them yeah yeah and then that's it you now you just developmentally grade it what you do at four is going to be different. What you do at seven, what you do at seven is going to be different. What we do at fourteen, yeah. and what you do at eighteen is going to be different. What we do at fourteen, so it's the same things, but it's all developmentally graded. Yeah, and I'm going to I'm going to throw myself in the in the works of this. So yeah. when I was I, I can't swim very well. It's mm. like one of those like you're a kiwi and you can't <laughs> swim very well. But my parents weren't really water babies. My dad can't swim, and it just wasn't a thing that was done. Yeah. And then I had a bad experience. My cousins lived in Tauranga and they were in Te Puna and they went to Little Nippers like all the time. I spent one weekend with them. They took me there. They put me in the big kids group and I almost drowned and got sucked down by a rip. Oh. And so I'm like, oh, moving water. And so my Puma. kids love the beach. My husband loves the beach. And I am the family handbrake. Like I am just mm. on high alert all the time. And because I'm like, come in. And I'm like, and so I'm trying not to be like, I am so freaked out right now. I can't handle it. And just go, no, go with dad. It's all good. And I just sit on the beach just like, and my eyes are on all three kids at all times. Like no one's on my side. That's exactly it. From a, from that like fear-based approach from a parent, because I want my kids to be confident and I want mm. them to swim well and I want them to love the beach and, you know, experience those things. But how do you as a parent, when you're that frightened, I guess, mm. then manage that to build their confidence? I, I know you're going to say, I have to start building my own confidence in the water too. <laughs> But, but yeah, like how do you, how do you do that without? Because I don't want them to fear it because I mm, fear it. Totally. Yeah. Well, you're right. There's only one. You know, like as a parent, if you can find opportunities to model and display the very things that they're going through themselves, mm. you've got a gold mine. Yeah. So really, parents, because often parents get criticised for doing what their kids are doing. Why don't you have your own life? Stop doing what they're doing. That's their dream. That's their life. Yeah. Bullshit. Yeah. I want to hang with my kids. If they surf, I want to surf. If they ski, I want to ski. If they want to play basketball, I want to play basketball. Yeah. I don't play in their team. No. <laughs> I, I take them to basketball, but I'll play basketball. Yeah. So for you with the what you've got with the swimming, you see how that, if they see you, because they'll see you on oh, the yeah. beach, they know what's going on for mum, even though you cover mm. it really well. Imagine if you start now a five, ten year journey to be able to f- swim free beyond the breakers and start doing surf swimming yeah. or um, ocean swimming. Yeah. There's the goal. Yeah. The process and the journey is 110 decibels. Mm. They're now seeing mum do 110 decibels. We don't compromise their paths by our own path. It's in and around their path. So if it's their little nippers, they swim, we look after them, we volunteer, we help in the committees, all those sorts of things. Yeah. But I'm also doing the adults' little nippers. Yeah. I've also got my coaching on ocean swimming. I'm going to do my things on my time. But they're seeing mum all of a sudden, mum's out swimming out to the yeah. 5K mark or whatever, or my 5K. 500 meter marker yeah yeah or maybe 5k like, where's mum on God, the horizon yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be she alright I think so <laughs> she keeps coming back yeah. so, but uh, see how that's a gold nugget yeah but only by experience will we do that you can't yeah. think yourself away from that fear no you just can't um, and that, like that for me is like such a great example for all parents um, I was in I was actually catching up with a coffee with a friend at the hippie tuff I love catching up with people at the hippie tuff on Bridge Street. Yeah. Man, I just love going there and sitting there. One of the photos is um, patience and remember. Pause. Pause and remember. Yeah. How good is that? I took a photo of it today. I was just like, oh, that's such a good little wee. Yeah. For us as parents, just pause and watch. Yeah. You'll see everything that you need in that stage with the child's development to go, oh, there it is. Mm. we can just drop into that as a family pause now the 10 mm. where is it now there it is so every yeah. time we pause watch the kid think about where they're at 
we will find the little nugget, whether it's self-defense, learning boxing, learning to swim. Yeah. Now we learn to surf. Now we do surf lifesaving. Yeah. One thing, if I had a chance again as a parent, I would do surf lifesaving with the girls. Yeah. Didn't do it, kicking myself up the ass now. That one thing will give our kids... If the government wants to take care of mental health in our teenagers, they should make um, surf lifesaving a compulsory activity at school. Yeah. From 5 to 13, you have to do surf lifesaving. Put on buses... Pay for pay for the fuel. Get the kids to the beach. We could go to Raglan from Hamilton. Yeah. We could. You, you're not very far from a beach, mm. so the government could do that with all the five to thirteen year olds, and you can guarantee that our all of our bad stats in teenage years would be massively influenced. Wow. Because of the confidence it gives them. Yeah. You know, if you did if you did self defence and little nippers surf life saving through to open, whatever it is, so that's for your confidence. You can swim in anything. You can look after yourself in anything. Yeah. You're sweet. And you can do self-defense through to that same sort of level. I reckon our mental health stats would be completely different. I reckon our just all of the crime stats would be different. Yeah. Plus, if you did identity and those sorts of things when you get to those ages and stages, you've got a lovely little wee resilience building program. So parents, we can do that. We can relax, learn, you know, camping, fishing, swimming, yeah. watching the stars, going out as a family, camping on the back lawn. Mm. How simple was that? Yeah. But your kid's taking you camping. But you're going to together learn how to light a fire, together yeah. to learn how to catch something and cook something yeah. and do it together. They end up doing it, and then in the end they look after you. So the best as a parent is because you get to go on the holiday. Yeah, I'd go just for the marshmallows. Yeah, totally, marshmallows. totally. <laughs> you know, when we were going, we were going camping two or three times a week on the Napier Taupe, a desert road. Yeah. Napier Taupe or the desert road. So all those little offshoot roads. We would never get further than 100 metres from the tent. Because you'd go for a walk and we'd go for a hunt. And then all of a sudden the kids would go, the girls would go, can we go and do sausages? And then we'd go marshmallows and then just want to play in the tent. That would be our experience. Mm. But then there's a frost and you wake up in the morning and there's just ice everywhere. So now you've got all of this winter playground. Yeah, yeah. My kids call that ice skating. We go out on the back lawn yeah, and they yeah, yeah. another bomb. Yeah, so what is that? That's like one tank of petrol in a shitty tent in the summer on the Napier Desert Road. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Or anywhere along the Lake Taupo. Yeah. And that's only one an hour down the road, really. But there's also lots of rivers between here and there where you can camp. So, a lot to be said, eh, for adventure. Like, totally. And what you know, it doesn't actually have to be a big adventure to uh. feel like a big adventure for the, yeah. the little, yeah, little humans. I remember um, going out with an adult who had grown up in the city, and I took them out to the coast just for a trip. And we got out there at ten o'clock at night. They hopped out of the truck, and they were just standing. And I went, "What?" And they went. <laughs> That. And I went, what do you mean? Mm. And they said, does it look like that every night? And I went, yeah, <laughs> it looks like that every night when you get away from the lights. They thought that the stuff that you see in photos was all lensed and magnified. Oh, wow. They had no idea about the Milky Way. Oh. And I'm, that, that person was our age. And yeah. I'm just going, well, there's the thing, isn't it? How many kids spend time looking up rather than looking at yeah. their device now? Yeah. Just get outside, get away from the lights and let them see, let them chase a shooting star and a satellite yeah. and count and see how long it takes for it to come back again. That's so cool. People wouldn't know how long it takes for a satellite to go around the planet. And you're yeah. like, what? You know, like, it's like, um, some kids, they think steaks come from the supermarket. They don't realize the cow in the paddock, that's the steak. They have no idea about that no. connection. Yeah. And you're going to do some basics. You ask them which way is east, and they're like, what? What? Yeah. But you see how basic tools. Yeah. Imagine if your kids can learn how to cook, learn how to swim, learn how to navigate. Yeah. Because all of these are metaphors for life. Yeah. And then they hit 18 years old. They're going to be ready. They're away. So you can see how it's not complicated. That's the biggest yeah. thing for me as a parent is, honestly, I'm not, I'm not the greatest of parents, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm good enough. And then that's yeah. the key, you just have to be good enough. Sometimes I lose my, lose my rag and sometimes I'll take over and sometimes I'll do it for them because I'm just like in a rush. Yeah. Doesn't matter. But in general, if you can keep thinking what do you want them like at 18, and it doesn't mean to say it's going to be smooth sailing. They can get to 18 and you, they go off on their first whatever it was and they may get a big shock because you're still safe. Like, even when you're doing that, it's still nowhere near what the pressure is going to be like in life. No. And the life comes at them real fast hard, real hard fast. And, and that's one thing i've noticed is that it feels like life now is more unforgiving than what it was mm. and sadly um much more paranoid yeah so you just have to think as an example what does that mean well if i get a flat tire on the road no one stops no 
No one. No could be the middle of the night, no one stops. I could be someone desperately in need, not one car will stop. No. And everyone, like I've been in a car where I've gone, oh my God, those guys need help. And someone will say to me, they'll have a phone. Yeah. And we just keep going. And then that's the excuse. Yeah. And on we go. I'll have a phone. Yeah. And mm. when you stop with people, people are like, oh my God, thanks very much. And it's like, but it's always we used to do that. You'd yeah. always stop. Yeah. But it feels now we've got to a point where no one trusts. And we go, go all the way back to the beginning. No one's singing 110 decibels anymore. Mm. What's their view of themselves? Well, I think a lot of people question themselves now, whether they question their self-worth now. They don't trust others. Yeah. They don't trust, um, I guess, the way the world flows or what the future's going to look like. And you think about the last 18 months, we've had two years. Mm. You ask people now, how are you feeling about the future? I bet you a lot of people are like, I don't really know. No. I'm petrified. Because yeah. what have we had? Two years of pandemic and then Russia decides to throw the weight around. <laughs> it's like, and then they talk about China. So it's all of a sudden, like, holy hecka. Boom. Yeah. Have confidence. Have self-belief. Pl- have ambition. Plan for the future. Yeah. People are petrified. They are. They are. But they also don't know which way the sun comes up. They don't know how to cook a sausage by themselves. They couldn't start a fire without a match. Yeah. They, they, when the power goes off, they're stuffed. <laughs> right? So all these things, no wonder they're scared. Yeah. Because the thought of actually having no power, looking after themselves, it just unnerves. Like your feelings you have about the ocean, mm. I have the same about the ocean. But the metaphor is people have that about life. Yeah. People are looking at life at the moment like you are on the beach, yeah. right? And oh like I God. am when I'm in around the big rocks, I'm like, kids. <laughs> yeah. that's how people are with life. Yeah. They're looking out the door now and they're going, <laughs> it's even It's the uncertainty too. Like, I mean, I never did an OE as a kid. Like I mm. it wasn't, my parents were older and it was a fear of mine to be away and, they, okay. and something happened yeah. to them, which yeah. nothing ever has. And yes. I totally could have gone and done it. Could have gone. You know? um, and now you look at kids who, you know, have been craving that OE and then they haven't been able to no. do it. I know. And then that going, so am I ever going to sort of... And, then, and I'm thinking the same because I've really never seen the world. I'm like, am I ever going to get to no, to do that? And like, what annoys what is me is there's no choice. No. We get told things, but we tell ourselves things. Mm. And then you will have told 20 other people that also. Or yeah, go through and there. you'll have friends that have lived the same yeah. culture. And all of a sudden you go, yeah, yeah, absolutely, you should stay. Yeah, absolutely get that job. Absolutely live here yep. for the rest of your life. Yep. Absolutely be that unhappy. Absolutely be that scared of the sea. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I get that. I get that, right? And then we just end up stuck. So... The irony is, and this is what I guess is the big kick up the ass, wherever our decibel meter is set for singing, that's where our kids will be set. That's where our kids will be set. Our kids will be set, so your kids will be set there, you're set there, your parents were set there, their parents were set there, their parents were set there, mm. back to 1100, and that's the social genetics that's been passed mm. down. That is your that is your ancestral legacy. Yeah. That's been set for you. You step into that decibel and you sing the same because guess who you look at when you start singing? Mum and Dad. Yeah. They are either doing the same thing and you just set yourself to the same level. Mm. And then you'll do your children the same way and you'll do the children the same way. There's a song that's going round and round in my head as you talk and it's called Live Louder. Ah. And that's actually become my family's theme song for the next month. Now we're going to, like, mm. it's, it literally mm. says Live Louder. Like, and the mm. song comes up and the trumpets are going and it's like, Live Louder. So that's what we should do right totally so you can see how when we think about how we help our children get to that point it's experience it's jumping in with them it's, it's modeling through your own discomfort and you learning and being a novice and becoming an expert through years of practice and applying yourself and the rest happens all by itself mm. because by the time they're 15 you know for example by the time they're 10 they should be washing their own washing they should be helping kitchen kick it cook in the kitchen if you go on a hot camping trip they should be doing a lot of that yeah. by 17 they're going camping with their friends yeah so all of a sudden they go camping with their friends and they're the expert yeah so their confidence is going to be through the roof because they'll go with their friends and the friends will go oh i'm lost mm. and you'll be like what do you mean you're lost but they can navigate through bush and use rivers and use the sun and the stars and whatever it is, mm. and they can get from A to B. It's going to be a rare, rare skill in the next little while. Yeah, rare and then that's skill. a metaphor for life because yeah. it's you know, yeah. traveling around town on a city, on a bus, on a plane, getting to a different country, getting passport uh, visas. All of that is where they need to be at 18. So you just keep thinking, and I obviously haven't been perfect at it, so don't please don't think that me talking <laughs> about it, I've got an absolute nail, but I was constantly thinking by 18. Yeah. So you get questions on these phones. Dad, what do you reckon about this? Right, so there's a moment. Mm. And then that's where you just message back, or I just message back, I just send photos back about how I want them to be thinking about themselves. I just send a photo back. And they know, oh, okay, I've got to decide. So there's those moments when we get asked, what do I do? What do you think? What would you do? Just pause. Yeah. 
and even if you have to say I don't know just say I don't know you have a try figure it out yeah all right um so you have spoken about how important it is for a child but I think this is also for anybody to go to sleep really liking themselves and and having some good reflection questions to sort of put them into that beautiful mindset as they drift off Mm. and as I think we personally Mm. drift off as well and it was I think one of it's like what's your favorite moment of the day what did you learn today Mm. but oh I won't put answers in your mouth but Mm. yeah sort of tell us because bedtime can often be and regardless of age to be fair but it can be like that rush time of day where it's dinner Mm. get your homework done bang 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 or like I can't believe you forgot to to take your dogs to school I can't sleep yeah (laughs) <laughs> Didn't you get that out of your bag earlier and you just... That's like three weeks old, that apple core. <laughs> <laughs> but the, my question here, I guess, is twofold. So that's bedtime. But it's also like when you pick your kids up from school or kindergarten and like questions you could be asking them because mm. often you go, how's your day? Good. And it's like, mm. like mm. brick wall came down. Is what sort of qu- like questions or do you ask a question or is there mm. a framework you can build for your family that it's just an open... Mm. Yeah. There's a couple of layers to that too, um, and our questioning, if we understand what the purpose of life is, then that will assist us in the questions we ask and the places we go with our kids when we have a conversation. Because there is so much you can talk about and so much distraction that can take us to a place which is really, there's no benefit in going down mm. some of these rabbit holes. There's been rabbit holes forever and I don't think there's there always will be so that choice is really important to figure out what you will and what you're not going to talk about Mm. and so we go okay so what's the purpose of life the purpose of life is to add to the ancestral legacy which we use as a term before so that's the goal the goal is in our time to contribute to our lineage in a way that when people look back on our shadow they see pride Mm. that's the goal nothing else I don't care what people say our behavior is about contributing to our own legacy, which is our turn now, because one day we will be the ancestor and they'll talk about us. That's our goal every day. So if we think that simplicity, now our conversations with our kids becomes about them understanding that goal yeah. and then deepening and reinforcing and celebrating and strengthening. So if you hold that as your reference point, the questions that you can then ask what's your best memory today or what what do you think today Graham would have been really excited about right so now you can actually bring them into the conversation if they've passed or if they're alive so you can make a now comment about that so your best memory um, can be whatever way you do it and then the the thing is when you get the memory now we need to be genuinely engaged (laughs) So we want to make sure we then dig deep. Mm. Tell us about the memory. Yeah. Tell us as much detail about the memory. Ask good questions. Yeah. Once you get the memory going, ask them to take you there in the mind, relive it yeah. with them. So that one question, that given them whatever the moment is, that can be five, 10, 15 minutes conversation that then leads us on a journey of reflection. Mm. So when you get the good, that, that's that's just what we've got. Yeah. But that will change over time if you then have a cup of tea, slow down, sit down, have afternoon tea, ask questions. Because if they're eating a piece of toast with honey on it, having hot chocolate or a cup of tea, you, you've got them, you've got a captured moment. Yeah. That's at least 10 or 15 minutes. So it's now up to your own curiosity to be genuinely attached and not thinking, oh good, got to get home, then I've got to do this, got to do that, get back to my phone, do that email, send that to John, blah, 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 blah. We're not engaged in that moment. No. So be in the moment, ask a question, but then just don't go on until you've got real depth. So your best memory of the day, the, you know, the memory where you've contributed to the ancestry, which could be what are you most proud about from, what are you proud about from what you did today? Talk to me about that. Then you hear it, then you get the feedback. If you've done the family work and you've got an idea of great grand grands, et cetera, et cetera, you can then say, granddad Ollie would be so proud of you because you know what his history was, don't you? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, I remember he went to, see, he went to that war, didn't he, all those years yeah. ago, yeah. Because he did what you did. He stood up for what's right. Yeah. You're just like Ollie. Right, so now yeah. you've got the conversation, now you've got the depth, and you're away. But it's all as a natural discussion. Yeah. 
and but then you pause and take the time totally to totally and then you it. now you've got something that you can put in a birthday card you've got something that can go on the next present you've got something that can yeah. go when you ruffle their hair as you kiss them good night <laughs> you've got all of those little bits that you can then feed yeah. back to them so best memory what are you proud about what did you learn mm. so that's a good question what did mm. you learn today at school nothing often hear nothing yep. right and then i'm just like there we go there's education yeah right this has been great fun at school today isn't it? it sounds like you had a great day at school today it must have been lots of fun yeah it was just like yesterday yeah so i i get annoyed because school should be when you ask what did you learn it should be like blah 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 oh, wow we were doing this in chemistry we blew up this yeah, and whatever yeah. it might be like <laughs> yeah. it should be markedly should be making a mark on them yeah so you can still explore, you can ask what subjects, you can ask where, what's in the what's in the book, and then show me your book that you did writing in. So you can keep digging into that space as much mm. as we want to and feel connected to. But I'm a real strong believer in the experience in the family is worth way more than the experience at school. And I'm, I'm bagging the education at the moment, but I reckon life experience, social, ex for me, school was about social connectivity. 100%. Not about learning to read and write, regard, waste of time. Mm. I can learn to read and write at any age, but I can't learn to connect with you at any age. I can't learn to care at any age. That's yeah. what school's about, sharing, caring, and having social experiences. Yeah. We need to master that, then who we, who we are, and then doing charity and doing that as a class. That's what education should be about. Um, so anyway, the, you, you'll you find that in the, the books and stuff they bring home. Yeah. So those three questions can drive conversations, can drive the moment. The moment will drive it, the questions become layers, which you can then slot into you can have a journal on the counter at home we think we've talked about that we yeah. have a journal on the counter which can be um, you can write notes in that that they leave it open write your notes based on your interactions your observations the things you love about your kids they'll look yeah they'll walk past and they'll see what mum's written and what dad's written yeah. they'll they are very curious yeah. to see what we think and what we've written so you can write your highlights what you learnt, what you're proud about what you're excited by then put one by their by their bed, and they have to do it before they go to sleep. That's such a cool idea, though, because it's like because I do a journal. Yeah. But how like but it's like my experience yeah. of the day. But how cool is that to actually have like family perspective journal almost of, you know, it's yeah, so simple but so powerful. Yeah. And then they give keep. I rather they keep those in their cupboards than yeah. oh no, some of their school books are good to keep because that's a thrill for them to see where they <laughs> progress to yeah. and what they used to be like and. Or the notes they used yeah, to yeah. write to yeah, themselves right. on the back pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but if they could keep the books of the journaling from mum and dad or uncle and auntie or whoever across the years, mm. uh, that would be a pretty powerful anchor. So powerful. Mm. You've given me yet another. I, I knew <laughs> I'd walk good. away with a pile of things That's to do. That's good. Um, we, expectations is a word that I mm. like bandy about quite often at the moment because like we have expectations of ourselves mm. and then we think people have expectations of us to act in a certain way and parent For in sure. a certain way or yeah. do anything in a certain way and then we're obviously putting expectations on our children to be certain ways and you know if they make noise and inappropriate terms, like, Shh, like you know <laughs> and we feel like people are expecting us to keep them quiet or you know mm. keep them in love whatever it is but i feel like expectations is an incredible danger zone and so i'm just leaving that open to whatever yeah. that might come with you but yeah yeah. A again, it's uh, if we can have our perspective right of things, it changes our experiences mm. with things and with words. So I'll I'll chuck into the mix. I love the word expectations. I want to have expectations. I want kids to have expectations. Mm. I love the word perfection and excellence. All these ones that we get really quite yeah. nervous about. I love those words. What happens is people miss the, the recipes wrong around those words. So mm -hmm. if we just take expectations, let's have a conversation about what expectations do we want to have in our kids. I'm going to have expectations on our kids. I want them to have expectations on themselves because if they have no expectations, we've got no governance. Yep. So we've got to have them comfortable with expectations because mm -hmm. that's their own individual governance in the end. Yep. Our job as parents early on is to provide the governance because they can't. Yeah. But we then better make sure that we're shaping the governance to get to 18 that they're their own magistrates because <laughs> if they aren't by 18 you're in for a shit show yeah drugs bad relationships in the shit with the cops yeah leaving home running away from home at 13 whatever it might be mm. they haven't learned governance so, so we need true. expectations but we've got to have relate got to have a, a way that we do that and for me it's about baking the cake so 
let's think about the recipe. If we're baking a cake of expectation, what's the recipe? Well, the first expectation is never forget where you're from. So I expect my children will always remember where they are from. Identity. Yeah. Huge expectation. Who's your grandparents? Who are your great grandparents? Who are your great great grandparents? Yeah. Where do you fuck a papa back to? Yeah. See how there's an expectation on me and on them. I want them to understand that deeply. Do we going to go? We have to go around. We have to go to grandma's again. Yes, you are going to go and do grandma's lawns yeah. again, even though it's only like last week, <laughs> right? So now we're starting to build in. What's my first expectation on myself? Never forget where I'm from. Yeah. So you see how that's a beautiful expectation. A, yeah. Second one. Do what you love. First one's going to hold work because that's don't forget where you're from. Give more than you get do your share, contribute. Mm. That's all that one, right? Yeah. So there's some great expectations in there. So when we go to grandma's, what do you do? You sit on your ass? No, you get out and you do the lawns, you do the garden, you help carry across the vegetables. Yep. You actually help grandma. You're gonna stay the night because you need some help. I'm only six dad, doesn't matter, yeah. right? So there's the expectation. So that sets up a beautiful layer. Imagine what that's gonna be like at 18. Yeah. Never forget where I'm from. What does that mean? Give more than I get. Yeah. Remember what my grandparents did. Beautiful expectation. Yeah. So the second one is okay, so I've got that one now. The next one is, well, do what you love. Why are you playing cricket? I love cricket. Do you? Oh no, John plays cricket and Tim plays cricket and they want me to play cricket. I actually yeah. hate cricket. Right? Well, so why are you playing cricket? I don't have to play cricket? No. You don't love cricket? No, I don't really like cricket. Okay, cool. You're not playing cricket. What do you love? Oh, I love skeet shooting because I did that with one of the things at school. I just want to yeah. go and shoot things. Cool, let's do let's that. Let's go. <laughs> right, whatever it is, second expectation, make sure that if you, with your children, you're asking, do you love this? Do you love that? Let's try some things. You found that, you love it, cool. Now you've signed up to the team. You're doing what you love. But now we've got two expectations. We're doing what we love and don't forget where you came from, which means you now finish the season, Sunshine. Mm. Three weeks in, oh, I don't like basketball anymore. Tough. You've committed. Expectation, mm. don't forget where you come from. Mm. What's that? That's that. So we follow through, we have integrity, we finish things off. So there's an expectation. Yeah. So you got, don't forget where you're from, do what you love with who you love. Third one, well, we throw the kitchen sink at it. So if you're in, you in? Yeah, I'm in. Right, let's talk about what that means. Because yeah. this means being in. So now I'm going to expect them to work hard. I'm going to expect them to expect themselves to work hard. I'm going to expect them to go early and set up the sports ground. I'm going to expect them to stay late. Mm. I'm expecting lots of things. Mm. And you imagine the rewards they get when they're little and the parents are like, oh, you're such a hard worker, aren't yeah. you? You must be so-and-so's grandson. Because yeah. that's what they say when yeah. they're little and they're working their yeah. asses off like that. And then all of a sudden you've got this lovely social praise. That's so, so that's getting it neurologically just hardwired. Yeah. Give more than you get, then you get apes. Yeah. Right? So there's the third layer of expectation. Fourth one, I expect that they can control their feelings. So you go back to what you said before, what Brene, Brene, Brene Brown saying, mm -hmm. let them experience the distress, let them be distressed. I remember with my oldest girl, because she fell off three meters when she was 18 months old, she fell off three meter stair onto concrete on her head. Ooh. How she didn't die, I don't know. Three meters, so it's higher than this house. Yeah. So higher than as high as that top, off there, straight onto concrete when she was 18 months old. And she always had explosive tantrums after that, like unreal explosions. And I'd just say to her all the way through, um, essentially just long story short, I'd say, sweetheart, the hardest thing that you're gonna to have to learn is how to control your emotions. Mm and it'll get easier. But dad expects you to learn how to do that. And she'd break windows, wow. unreal, unreal explosions. Um, and she still has stuff now as a teenager. You can still see that neurology in there. Yeah. But way, way better. It got better over time and now she can control emotions. So I want them to learn how to control their emotions. Yeah. So teach them breathing. Teach them how to breathe. Mm. Do breathing with them. There's so much online, you can go and learn to breathe. If you're going to do swimming, well then learn to have breath hold. Yeah but find a way to be able to go yeah. and quieten. So expect them to be able to learn how to quiet and go and read a book, sit on the couch, have a quiet cup of milk, whatever it might be. They'll find their way. Yeah. But when they're losing their shit, we get so caught up in it, they have to behave differently. Well, we haven't given them any tools to control, yeah. learn how to do that differently. And how are you doing that with them? And where do you sit quietly? And where yeah. do you slow down? And where do they see you control your shit? Mm. Because usually mum and dad do exactly the same thing, but yeah. somehow they are excused from that sort of behaviour. Yeah. 
We have so much opportunity to do that. We can do that when we're camping, having a quiet cup of tea. If we're mm. playing sport, we can do that after a hard training session, whatever the age is. And as they get better and things, this is going to become powerful mental skills anyway. Mm. So if they're playing upper level rep grade sport, well, they should be able to do that anyway because they're going to have to do that if they want to be any good. Yeah. So then there's an expectation. And see how what I've done is you've got layers of expectation. Yeah. And now we can chuck in perfection and excellence. So yeah. I expect they chase it. Yeah. Well, actually, I'll chuck one more in before there. The other expectation is I want them to learn to dance and waltz with pressure. So I want yeah. them to actually have a relationship with pressure yeah, yeah. and think about it that way. And the metaphor of dancing with pressure is I want to make my relationship with pressure like I'm waltzing on a floor with a beautiful partner who knows how to dance and we just groove, right? It's a beautiful metaphor. Yeah. That's pressure. So if we can have the perspective of if they can see pressure, if they've got pressure, if we can love pressure, if we can talk about it. What was your best memory of that of pressure today at school? And we yeah. just start to talk about yeah. pressure in a way where it's our best friend. Yeah. Because pressure is the best friend. Pressure is where your potential lies. Yeah. If you don't go to pressure, you're never going to go to your potential. Be just a five out of ten on the on the line that we talked yeah, about before. Yeah. Five out of ten is I do not go to pressure, I have a bad relationship with pressure. Yeah. If there's no pressure, I go good. If there's any risk, I'll go bad. And I hate it. Yeah, and avoid. The whole language about pressure becomes this negative thing. Mm. So the parents should have that understanding again, so that when we talk about it, we actually dance the pressure. Yeah. So we have to have a philosophy where I expect us to live in it, we create it, we want it, we build competition. Well, our parents don't really, I guess it's for where I live, is where I want them to be able to be comfortable with that, because it is a part of life. When yeah. you go for a job interview, that's pressure. Yeah. Kids won't go for that because 50 others have put their uh, CVs yeah. in. So what? Put it in. It's the same with like a nipple trial. And they're like, same. oh, I never, I exactly. never trial well. Exactly. I never trial exactly. well. Exactly. <laughs> Sport, life, same thing. Yeah. Right? They just shorten it down, made it a micro moment, put the boundary around it, giving you rules and go, yeah, there's life. Mm. The start, whistle goes off, that's birth. Final whistle goes, that's death. Yeah. Life's just finished. How'd you go? That's all sporters. Yeah. So dance with pressure. Now we're ready to ch now we're ready to chase perfection. Mm. Now we're ready to chase excellence because people say perfection doesn't happen. Bullshit! It happens all the time. Yeah. There's a little micro moment. Then you might get your ass handed to you for the next 40 minutes or 39 minutes, <laughs> 10 seconds of the half, and end up 45 nil down half time. But the kickoff was amazing. Yeah. So there are little micro moments of perfection all the time. They're everywhere. They're in physics. They're in maths. They're in English. They're in whatever subject at school. There'll be more moments of perfection. Their day will have it. Mm. Our day will have it. Mm. So expect perfection, chase perfection, find it, cherish it, and bet it. And then you get a moment when you hunt perfection and you lose. So now we be a, gra a gracious, is that how they say it? Humble in victory, gracious in defeat. Yeah. So now we be gracious. gracious. So what does gracious look like? Well, it means that we do what our grandparents did, which is we help pull out the tables, we stay for the fight, we say congratulations to the person yep. that won, we shake their hand and say, great job, you're amazing, mm. even though you're hurt, hurt, yeah, hurt, yeah. hurt, hurt. And then we leave. Now you've won. Yeah. So now you've got icing on the cake. People come up and say congratulations, and when we learn how to say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Then we pack up and we leave. So yeah. the humility and the gratitude, graciousness. So you can see how there's the, it's the things in and around it. So yeah. the pressure itself, I want parents to understand that conversation because I don't believe society understands it anymore. So you can see how the conversations that we have, the expectations sit in the conversations or the philosophy of expectation and pressure sits underneath the conversations. If we're comfortable with it, we can have conversations with it. Yeah. If we're not comfortable with pressure, we can't have conversations yeah, about it because it pushes all our buttons. Yeah. But that's our own sense of you know worth and our relationship with our identities attached to doing this and doing that and getting that and getting that's not anchored in there at all. So parenting again comes back to well, we better have your own shit together. Yeah, yeah. Know where you've come from. Yeah. I think also too, like you mean you talked about breathing ages ago, but that parents forget that. Yeah. And we get wound up, and that could be at a work situation where all the stuff goes wrong, and you're like, mm. you know, and Sam, our cameraman, or we <laughs> recently had this happen at his job where, you know, everything goes wrong, and you've got to, got to figure it out really quickly. And mm. that's where the, what do you say, 
rises to the top, cream rises yeah. to the top of, of what your foundation yes. is to actually cope totally. in that moment. Is yes. Do I walk out of here and just be like, shove it, I'm out? Or do you mm. go, Find let me take two minutes, I'll reset, I'll come back, and then let's build a plan. Like, And I think that lacks a lot. Mm. I mean, I'm 36 in our age group. There's mm. a lot that can't do that mm. and go, oh, I'm not feeling all right. If I stay here for another couple of minutes, I'm probably going to lose it. So I just need a couple of minutes or perspective check, I'll be back. You know, or actually, this isn't that bad. Like, yeah. we're not going to have that. Well, we don't have that. You know, people aren't, not everyone knew that we were having it in the first place. Don't worry about it. Park it. Keep moving. <laughs> exactly. Um, so coaching kids, I, this has been an interesting thing of my whole, I mean, again, I'm 36. I've been in netball since I was seven years old. And watching coaching has been, mm. and being the kid who was coach, obviously my parents never coached. My mum was always the manager and dad was always on the sideline, but I find it a really interesting space of how we're coaching our kids and the messages like often half times like you haven't been hitting the line you're not doing this you need to be driving harder here you know have you seen this kid he's doing it. you need to copy what this kid's doing but you should be ashamed of yourself yeah and we're not you know and they will get the oranges and they're you know chewing away and they're okay okay coach but I don't think we're sending them back onto that field with any type of strategy to actually go and lift to where we're asking them to or hmm or to be observant or reflect on what's mm. actually gone on. So do you have some messages for coaches of children, I guess, and for parents on the sideline too, to be mm. fair of the, you know, the yelling and stuff that mm. happens off the sideline. But For sure. Yeah. Well, I guess the first thing is I always cage my coaching parent conversations around sport and firstly, massive gratitude for people to put their hands up. Oh yeah. Like we, our sports are dying because parents are struggling to cross that line and mm -hmm. volunteer because of the layers now around the rules and regulations and health and safety and how we should do this and how we should do that. And so you can see how sport is struggling because it's become a really touchy mm -hmm. conversation too and a place. So I think first and foremost, parents that manage, coach, support, awesome. Yeah. And we need, we need to really support that. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then the second bit is it's no different than parenting. Mm. So the conversations we've had could have been all about coaching. Mm. We could have said exactly the same yeah. things because ironically in that moment, that coach, the manager, is a surrogate parent for 30 kids, yeah. let's say. Let's say it's a big school basketball team, 20, 20 kids. You are now for that next nine to 10 weeks or however long, well, yeah. maybe longer than that because it's two mm. terms usually, mm. isn't it? Three, it's, uh, two and three terms, second and third terms. So for that half a year, you're one of the most significant others in their lives. Yeah. So if they can understand that bit, you can go, wow, okay. So now just do it like parenting. Yeah. And the stuff we've talked about, if you just went through those layers, who are you? Who am I? Mm. Who are we? So if a coach can just slow down before they put boots on, put trainers on, get a ball out, have pizza at your house with the whole crew. Put on dinner, get the manager there, coaches there, pizza on you, have an evening as a team. Yeah. And then just have a conversation. Why are you playing basketball? Why are you here? Well, firstly, who are you? Who am I? Who are we? Right. But why are we playing basketball? Let's get that really clear. And just take some time, to, just like you, because in a family you do that over years, right? Yeah. But in the end, you have the same layers as you have in a team that you do over a team session, but that's the same as a family structure. Mm. So take some time, set it up, barbecue. So in fact, do regular barbecues across the year, across the season. Put on the calendar. We all yeah, through the in. tummy. Mm. So slow down, connect them, find a common link about why we're all here and what do we want. Because every kid that's come in wants to do something. Yep. They want to make a net, they want to make a rep team. Yep. They want to get better. They just want to have fun. They want to have mates. Mm. That's what will come out from that conversation. We'll, we'll dig into all of that. Yeah. Because we'll start with the mates and the fun and the connection first, and then we'll see who's good enough to go into reps. Mm. And we'll support them to go and do that. And some of you, if you're not good enough to go into reps, we'll join the crew because I wasn't either. Who cares? Yeah. But we're going to have pizza we're 16 have times, <laughs> and we're going to have so much fun. Yeah. Now we've got an opportunity for everyone's needs to be met. Yeah. We still haven't even got on the court, right? So now we've got some stuff also in that conversation. What should we expect from each other? Mm. What do you expect from me and what do I expect from you? But it's not then punishments and things that we're going to do if you don't arrive, yeah. right? That's, I wouldn't even have that conversation. Just what are we expecting? Cool, so that's how we're going to roll. 
now the coach lives that mm. we drive that we set up the resources the structures put them all on whatsapp make sure the messages go out make sure everyone's got the idea about how we roll and then just keep working through the examples of it yeah it'll take a couple of weeks to fine tune it and help people because some of those kids will come from under some difficult backgrounds yeah. So the fact they might be late, they might be late because they've helped two kids get home from school, they've had to cook dinner, they've had to do something at home, yeah. of course they're going to be late. Just roll with it, don't yell at them when they come through the door, understand yeah. them first, connect with them, find out about them. Now we're making it a family. But those layers that we talked about, mm. that first one, don't forget where you're from, well that first meeting is where we're from. Yeah. So now we've got an anchor that will have some history in it, and what we said we wanted to do and then you set up your training to give them some challenges to be able to live out the things they wanted to do and now you've got some rolling evidence so to keep a video recording start showing them examples of their grit their resilience their ability to think under pressure and then keep working them to where you want 18 years old is the same as 36 weeks time if it's a campaign yeah. we want them to get to 36 weeks which is 18 years old which is going out the auckland airport which is getting to a grand final to be able to run the ship themselves and the coach should stay home and watch it on tv yeah so they can understand that, then just keep working towards that. We and then you, let's say you've got um, fun, friendship and adventure. That might be the three key anchors to the campaign, yeah. whatever that sport is. And then the coach's job is to make sure they're attending to those things and doing their best to bring in experts if they don't even play the sport yeah. to help them learn <laughs> yeah. skills. Because kids do a sport, they want to get better. Mm. So skill, skill development, is the massive i guess if you think of what's the core threat of all sport skill development yeah. i don't care what level it is that could be international rugby why are they here to get better mm. they're already really good cool so it's going to be slower yeah it's going to be smaller but we still want them to be striving to get better yeah. so then the coach sets up if they can keep that in the head forget about the outcome forget about performance create the space create opportunities to get better even if that's not you but you're just facilitating people to come and do the skill development mm. and now we've got a lovely recipe and if you can be a weird fun loving coach that feeds them well gives them plenty of opportunities for fun friendship and adventure everything else will take care of itself yeah it's that team stuff too because parents like in my now experience like i've been coaching sort of like the year 10 groups mm. um being a sports client at little to junior high school but they hands off Totally. And if you say you need help with anything, no one's around. Yeah. And you're kind of like, well, I'm doing this out of the kindness of my heart and yeah, I don't yeah. get paid to do this. I'm not even a parent coaching. I'm just, you know, helping. Nobody wants to manage. Yeah. Nobody wants, like, you're just, you're alone. And so I think, and it comes back down to that stuff we're teaching our kids, right? You turn up early, you help, you yeah. help carry the gear bags. You totally. offer to fill up the water container or, yep. you know, those sorts of things. But I feel like coaches, if, if they're already kind of a reluctant coach, but they're doing it because like at our children's school, we'll get a notice. If we do not get a coach, no, no they do not play. Totally. And so my husband will, you know, too. finish work earlier or I'll do the same so that at least someone's there so that, you know, and I don't want to be coaching touch. I'm no expert in it. But if that's what it takes to get them to play, then you do it. Mm. But then you kind of need others to bandy around you. But they just fear that you're going to give them a job. Yeah. And so they're just invisible. In the so same. It's, it's that sort of conversation. Well, how you get that support so that you can do like if you've put your hand up to coach and you need to get better at it also yeah then you need other people to step up to yeah fill up you know pump the balls up each week or it's another again another metaphor of where our society's got mm. the same connection to why people don't stop on the road when they see a car dark at night with clearly a flat tire mm. maybe one person trying to change it people don't stop same thing with sports teams bring a kid along drop them off go away come back pick them up mm. There's no sense of community in that no. space at all, but that's what sport's about. It's about community. Yeah. So if coaches, managers can just think, okay, before we do anything, we've got to build community. Well, how do we do that? Food. Food. <laughs> Bring them in for a feed. Put a hungy down. Yeah. Put a big roast on. Get a pig on a spit. Invite everyone for a Sunday afternoon for have a feed and a swim in the swimming pool. There's your community. Done. Get to know each other. Now we've got names. We're on a WhatsApp. Send them WhatsApp. Send some photos. It's been lovely seeing everybody. Mm. And you've had a yarn too about what some of the things are going to be. You'll get people help now. Yeah. Just off that, you'll have people. Just let me know if you need a hand with anything. Yeah, yeah. That'll be the, that's what they'll say. Yeah. Oh, cool. Actually, I need to do that. Oh, yeah, I can do that. Put it on the wall. Here's the here's the nuts and bolts of us having a wonderful season. We need someone to do that. We need someone to do this. Someone to do that. Yeah. Who's going to do that? Oh, Granddad will do that. Great. Where is he? Can't oh, wait. he's in the rest time. Go and get him. Yeah, yeah. Can't wait. Bring him around. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then that that's how, if, every, if they just do that, it doesn't matter how good a coach you are. Mm. You may, the key thing is understand that the older they get, the more skill development they want. Yeah. 
So you've got to be ready to bring people in who know the sport mm. and can extend them. It's key because then if, this, if it doesn't happen, the kids will get frustrated because yeah. they'll feel like you're not coaching, you're managing. And there's a real difference between coach yeah. and manager. So that, let's say from year nine on, maybe even year seven and eight, mm. we've got to be doing skill development. Um, and helping them learn and master the game because mm. that's why they're playing that sport because they're yeah. good at it they want to get better at it and all kids love to be good at sport yeah. so just don't forget that's the other weave to just bring into everything they do yeah and then the kids all just love it mm. and it's the same as an adult isn't it like we don't want to do same. one job and do the yeah. same job every single day without correct one percent of getting a little bit better here yeah, or having totally. a better system and yeah, yeah. It's that yeah. that's why we do pd and we read and yeah it's a natural law that sits underneath it create community opportunity to get better and if they're any good opportunity to excel mm. support them to go to trials take them to trials mm. push hard for schools to have representative teams that go to nationals even if they're what they might not be the school might say oh well, they're not going to get anywhere yeah right like that's that's a conversation there's a conversation yeah. to have, which is we're sending that team to nationals mm. or regionals to get to nationals. So yeah, because it's no surprise that that's what sparks kids. Yeah. And it might even, it's just to get the trip to Rotorua to play the regionals to get to the nationals to go to Wellington, whatever. That might be the plan for the year that they talk about wanting to do. Yeah. And now we raise the money together. Um, so my last one today is sort of connecting and family time. And this will probably swing right back into the expectations we talked about earlier. But, you know, we, we kind of go, oh, I haven't, spend time with the family for a while we've been on the run or you know I've been working a lot or they've been at school mm. and doing extracurriculars so we're, we're gonna schedule out some family time and we we put a lot of expectation on there that everything's gonna go really well mm. and we're all gonna love one another <laughs> and the kids aren't gonna fight and you know and then the wheels can fall off and you've spoken about like paying attention to whether or not you feel closer to them after that yeah, family time. Yeah, totally. It's been a family outing yeah. or not. Or whether <laughs> it's, you know, had the opposite effect. So talk us through that and what we should be paying attention to. Like, and I'm assuming you're going to go for pay attention to what the kids want to do and go there. Mm. Like, you, like you don't want to go on the sea, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. There's a couple of really important layers there, which is alignment between mum and dad or uncle and auntie or mum and uncle or mum and what you know whoever the family caregivers are the children um because sometimes you'll have set up family opportunities to go and do things together but dad's all in or mum's all in and then dad's like i hate this yeah <laughs> right so you, you straight away you're buggered mm. and straight away you've missed the whole point so if we go what's our first lab well, we've talked about where we're from so that's not so relevant to this but doing what we love is. Yeah. So first and foremost, choose your activities really carefully because when they're young, it doesn't really matter what you do. But you should be asking, is this an activity that will allow us to have years of depth and growth and development? So surf life saving. Yeah. If, if both the parents hate the beach, it's not going to probably last. Mm. So that might become an activity that you do to help the children grow into the beach. But you might have something else that you like to do. Let's say a river, because sometimes people are river, rivers or lakes yep. versus sea. sea. Mm. So the first thing is just to think sensibly about it and have a conversation without the kids and go, what are we? What adventures can we do as a family? Because you need to have them. Mm. What ones will be? Are we both on the same page about? Because if you're not, you're doomed already. Yeah. Which ones can help us m mirror where we want them to go from being five and six, completely dependent on us in the sense of safety and packing and getting your blah, 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 to 18 where they are going away with their friends to do that. And then now you've got a developmental life plan for mm. that activity. So let's say camping. Do both parents love camping? Because if one doesn't like sand flies, you're in for a rough so road what? straight away, right? <laughs> but if you both love camping, now you're onto something which is fantastic yeah. because every activity has a developmental pathway that in the end the kids will go camping with their friends yeah. and then they'll be master campers yeah. or not. Mm. And if you've done your job right, whatever the activity, let's say it's horses, well then the end they'll be going to do their own things. If it's camping on the camping, hunting, hunting, whatever, whatever towny city folk do, it'll be the same <laughs> thing, right? Cafes. Yeah, so they'll then be going to cafes with their friends and they'll be really comfortable in the cafe yeah. culture, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's all relative. Mm. But the first thing I think probably, which is the, probably the first and last thing is alignment of the caregivers about what we're doing because mm. you've got to be in. 
otherwise it's doomed, mixed messages, someone's on the couch, they're not enjoying it, they're not going, they're not wanting to go, they keep one kid home, then the other one goes. Now you've got split family. Yeah. Where one becomes incredibly confident, let's say it's mountains, one becomes incredibly confident in the snow, one hates the cold. Yeah. Which is okay, but if that's been a shared experience, it's different, but if it's, now you've got that. Yeah. So that uh, that's really, really important and probably overlooked because people just start doing stuff like a dad will just dominate and go, We're gonna do we're gonna do wakeboarding. Mountain biking in my family. Right. Or whatever it is, mm. but they haven't had the conversation here no. to get alignment. Yeah. Um, and then that's the mist beach. Yeah. And that could be that can then be fifteen, twenty years of mist beat. Yeah. So that's the first thing is get it's no different than any business. Getting clear at the beginning, getting the strategic plan, getting our direction, getting our vision, who we are, why we're doing what we're doing. Same thing. And then it doesn't matter what it is. Honestly, it does not matter. No. The kids, when they're that young, you watch. Kids don't fall far from the tree. So if we love camping, the kids will love camping. If we love cafes, the kids will love cafes. And that's fine. Yeah. And then give them opportunities that they might want to do something else even though they haven't had that. Mm. Now we can shift and create opportunities for them but it's the alignment I reckon is the key right that's me but now I've got some quick fires alrighty three things that made you smile today seeing you drive out of our drive after you drive <laughs> in because you didn't know where you were <laughs> rather than just going I'm here that's even right. if it could be wrong I'm yeah, still yeah. <laughs> right so that made me smile I, I help people on a Monday morning and and I just love seeing the way that this is really old school like they are from what I grew up with so every yeah. time he talks and I see him it's just like makes me laugh about that's what I was like when I was growing up as a kid so that made me really early this morning um, oh, I had the people that were here before you arrived they just came to have a look at one of our new pets yeah. and they love what we've got and so I love what we've got and when people see our new pet they're like Oh my god it's gorgeous and i go yeah i know so i always smile when i see other people appreciate what i'm appreciating what is it? oh it's a little foal so it's not a little foal anymore it's a big Aww. it's a big foal uh favorite books our uh, favorite rather than rather than favorite book we favorite author because all of the david gemmels is like 32 of them but if i was to choose one of those as my favorite um would probably be the john oh john shadow series or maybe waylander okay. so waylander wolf in the shadow Unreal. Uh, three favourite smells? Horses. So anything about horses, even like the smell of horse shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> relish. We've got relish going at the nice. moment. I so can smell that, my yeah. tomatoes are going nuts, so I'm doing relish every second day at the moment. Coffee. Nice. Uh, what makes you laugh? I, I, really, I really like when people make genuine faux pas and just start laughing <laughs> about what they've just done so there's that genuine moment of laughter and the other thing is children's giggles mm. so children's giggling i just just start absolutely losing the plot yep. uh first job plucking rotten sheep and possum hunting so at seven i started seven i was running 15 traps and i'd do possums um and i'd I'd skin them, they were plucked these days, but it was skinning back then, and I'd take all my skins into um, Taradale to a guy from where I grew up in Hawke's Bay. Yeah. So I started possum when I was seven, but I was also plucking rotten sheep, because rotten sheep, you, one rotten sheep would make $10 with a scourers. Wow. And then I was running 30, 30, 30 traps through my teenage years, and my mate and I did possums together, and we were about a thousand skins a season. Um, so my first job was in the bush wow. trapping possums um, go to pick me up songs that fill your soul oh there's uh, there's one at the moment I, I don't know the, uh, the, the, the writers but don't don't give in don't give uh, don't give in um, I fear I fear, fear nothing it's a bit of a theme yeah they're quite punchy songs so I, I love them um, there's one which is the, the man who can't be moved yes so yeah, the script wrote that really, song. Really, yeah, yeah. really like those three. Um, ACDC, like uh, Back in Black, um, Thunderstruck, um, Highway to Hell. Any of those just keep mm, me going away. every time. Yep. Uh, three things you're grateful for today. Uh, I'm really, really grateful for our local community because in the last couple of years, the local community around here is really growing mm. um, and we've got really quite deep actually. So we're we've started a homesteading movement we're working really hard to, as a community to go well, what happens if 
price of fuel just continues to go through the roof? What happens if the power drops off again? Are we all okay? What happens if you know communications go down? Mm. So there's this real step back in time. Yeah. Um, so I'm really grateful for that group because we're constantly in touch with each other. Yeah. And then the people that I catch up with on a Monday morning just to just to give them a hand, you know, just just to help out. They are, they are from that group. Yeah. So it's kind of cool just being I'm really grateful to be part of that group because the last two years have been really tough. I guess I'm constantly grateful for because I meet some cool people mm. and have cool conversations. Like the conversations I have in the day are not normal way eh, in the sense of what normal conversations are yep. they're always people who are living in the four standard deviation and wanting to do amazing things yeah. and so i my so if you think about we are we are our culture our, we are we live we how do i say that we become the culture we immerse ourselves yep. in so even though there's lots of dark stuff happening in the world, my days are filled with light. Mm. Honestly, the conversations are people wanting to be better, to find new ways, to start new things. Yeah. So every time I have that conversation with them, they're my mirror about whether I'm living that way. Yeah, so yeah. I'm really grateful for that. Um, hobbies? Well, I've actually got two hobbies, because I'm learning to be a farmer. So mum and dad have come, we we we've got our little block of land, mum and dad live there. Um, I'm looking after them now until they go on their back half. Mm. And the condition is that Dad's my farming coach, so he's my coach, my mentor, and we've got well, we've got nineteen, we've got about around a hundred here for cattle, um, and he's been here for man his whole life. But now they're our Herefords; mm. they're not someone else's Herefords, mm. and so we are doing that hard out together. Um, so one hobby is I'm learning to be a farmer. It's not a job. Um, probably these conversations with people is my another hobby mm. that makes me my crust. Then the because the farming you don't make money you lose money, <laughs> um, so farming would be one hobby. And then I've been really lucky to have some you know, have some horses because I've worked in the Can worked in Canada, fell in love with horses, came home, traded to get what I've got. Um, and then my youngest and I ride together pony club together, and now we just do that hard out. Um, so my hobby is to scare the shit out of myself doing that as the challenge every day. Are you living courageously? Yeah. So two hobbies, farming, seeing both of them go together because we just do it rough yeah, yeah. on the farm. Um, what does a lazy day look like Ooh. for you? So that's an interesting <laughs> one because it's the word. Yeah. So I reckon we have, we have values and we have anti-values. Mm. So my number one value is work ethic. Yeah, me too. Well, not my number one, but yeah, yeah I value it. Yeah, really, really highly. So I don't care who you are, what you're chasing, I'll work with anyone in the business I do if their work ethic is high, even if they're only an a amateur athlete. Mm. I don't care what they're trying to chase. Mm. I want to see what they're prepared to put in. But the other end of that line is my anti-value, which is laziness. Yep. So I cannot stand it. No. It is the one thing that you want to fire me up, you just sit there. Yep. It'll fire me up oh and then God, we'll be having the conversations. Same. So that word I hate, yep. so I wouldn't ever have a lazy day. No. I don't know what day of the week it is. I know what my calendar tells me, but I actually don't have a day which is my lazy day. But I'll have a recovery day. I like that. And then a recovery day is, um, if it's pissing down with rain, I'll still get up and exercise yep. in the pissing down rain on my usual exercise time. Mm. And then I'll go back to bed. Yeah. Because it's a recovery day. Yeah. Which could be a, it could be a Sunday because then the whole family's here. Yeah. I'll burn wood in that fire that I've cut and they'll enjoy burning that fire and it's pissing down with rain and I've done my exercise, the work's done. Yep. Now it's a recovery day. So my best recovery day would be um, really stormy, really wet and miserable and cold. Um, I'm burning the firewood I've cut in the summer. I've been up and exercised. I've still had my porridge, nuts and blueberries um, by 7, 7.38. And then I might have another sleep at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock. Yeah. And then I'll have a coffee. And then I might have a late lunch. Nice. So that's my recovery day. Yeah. Um, but there's still some oh, the yeah. substance to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then if it's, the second one would be that you're doing something with family, or with friends, mm. and you're on an adventure. So you still might be buggered yeah. physically, but it's still a recovery day. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. This has been, oh, I love hanging out with you, David. <laughs> this has been the best. Cool. And I know that, I've been looked down the barrel. I know that there's going to be so many dg that come out of this and cool. so many takeaways, like baking the cake. Like it's such easy things that we can mm. 
put with ourselves that we can remind ourselves it's not out of reach for anybody it's mm. not too hard it's mm. yeah like breathe like it's, oh, absolutely it's simple basic things but we forget that because we're in the rush and we're compacting so much in and we actually just need to give it space and time and and listen and pay attention to what's mm. going on so mm. I can't wait to share this. I think it's <laughs> going to be amazing. But thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for asking me. I always love talking with you. Cause it, <laughs> it, it helps me. It helps me hear me. And then that just deepens everything. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. That I need to take care of that. Mm. Oh, that. That one's really good. Keep doing that. So I love it too because it's like a bit like a self-account, yeah, like a yeah. self-check. Yeah. I feel like there's like another four books out of today's chat. So, you know, I'll be waiting. I'll be waiting. Yeah. Um, but thank you very much for watching today. Um, make sure you give us some feedback about what you've enjoyed about this interview. And there'll be more coming soon. Kaki tech.